you very, everyone for coming here today. I'm really glad for this opportunity. Glad to share my knowledge on active learning for natural language processing. Uh, my name is Natalia Herzengi. And before we start the course, I would like to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about me. Um, so currently I'm a research fellow at CEDAR. I work with Dr. David Lillis and also Dr. Tamara Matthews on the Transpire project. This project uh, aims at analyzing, classifying, and extracting knowledge from uh, texts in the regulatory domain. And I am the researcher responsible for building an active learning system um, for multi-label classification texts in the regulatory domain. Uh, before this role at CEDAR, I worked uh, four years in Dublin City University. I was based in Dublin City University. And I worked on many projects in the field of natural language processing, but mainly focusing on uh, machine translation and machine translation evaluation. But um, so this is the first time that I work on a project involving active learning. So then I have to be honest and say that I am not like a, a really highly experienced researcher in this field. Uh, but I'm still, I'm still actually, I'm still learning. I'm still um, doing research in this topic. And I think this course is going to be a very good opportunity to share with you what I've learned so far and also to discuss with you. So then I think it's going to be kind of um, learning from each other, right? Uh, I'm going to show you, not in this session, but then in the next sessions of this course, um, a little bit about my work and the strategies that I use for active learning. Uh, and then in this session is going to be a, a more quick one because it's going to be just an introduction to active learning. Um, and then um, in the next session, next uh, Friday, we are going to see the most common techniques used, um, uh, mainly uh, focusing on uncertainty, uncertainty sampling. Um, for natural language processing um, use cases. In chapter three, we are going to have a hands-on activity and also we also talk about the user interface. So this is the main outline of um, this course. I saw on the um, comments of the, uh, of the, uh, the students enrolled in this course that uh, some of you are interested in learning more about active learning. Some of you are unfamiliar with active learning. Um, and then some of you, of you are not familiar with um, Python or even machine learning. Uh, so then you can um, ask me um, any questions related to this. But I have to say that this course is more like um, an introduction and also to show you the main strategies available on the literature. So then I'm not showing uh, here in this course something completely new. So I'm going to show you um, uh, my use case and also what I, I've done to solve my problem, but it's something that is already in the literature, okay? just to clarify that. But I hope you enjoyed the course and I hope you, um, you can learn from it, okay? So let's get started. Um, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Before we start, uh, I have to say that I'm open for questions after each chapter, but I am also open for questions as I go. So then you can just raise your hands and um, drop your questions into the chat. Um, and then uh, unmute yourself and ask your question so then everyone else can listen to your question, our discussion. And after this uh, uh, session, I'm going to upload the slides to the, 
activity feed on the CEDAR community website as shown by Alurism today. And then you're going to have access to the slides and also to the content for the next sessions. Okay. Um, what else? Um, here, um, uh, I have two textbooks. So then this course is mainly based on these two textbooks, which are the most traditional ones in this field of active learning. So then the active learning textbook, uh, the left side is a um, uh, very traditional one is from 2012. And then we have human in the loop machine learning, which is a very recent one that was um, issued last year in 2021. So then I, in my reading these two books, I see that they complement each other, uh, but they are very uh, good textbooks in this, in this field. And then I base most of this course on these two. Uh, books and also some um, articles, right? Okay, so then uh, now we can get started. So then what is active learning? So um, active learning is mainly, um, is mainly based on the question of whether we can train machine, machines with less labeled data uh, and less human supervision. This is the main question that active learning addresses, right? And why would we need less labeled data? First, because um, to label data can be very time consuming, right? It can require loads of human effort. And also because in many cases, and this is the case of natural language processing, depends on specialized knowledge, right? And if, if that depends on specialized knowledge, that can be very expensive. It's very expensive to hire experts um, to label um, data. And large amounts of data can be very time consuming. And sometimes for some projects, um, there is no budget available for that. So, that's why we need less labeled data. In the case of natural language processing, um, corpus uh, annotation is typically very expensive. So then in my use case, for instance, in the field of regulatory domains, we need experts uh, in this field to label data, to classify texts into um, regulatory categories. And this can be very expensive and also very time consuming. Um, in, um, for instance, in some cases, um, we have um, under-resourced uh, under languages because most of the labeled data that we have nowadays, they are in English, mainly, um, out, uh, me, mainly English, French, and German. Um, so then for languages such as, for instance, I don't know, Basque or Catalan, um, we don't have enough label data to train models. So then this is a problem. And then active learning is a way to overcome this problem. So then it's a, a, an appropriate way to reduce cost um, and, um, because, and also because it's easy to obtain large amounts of um, unlabeled data. Right for this, for these other resource languages and other um, corpus, right, and other um, other resource languages and other and also for other use cases. Uh, but then to get them annotated, it's very sometimes it's very complicated for all these reasons that I just pointed out. Um, so then the main assumption of active learning is that. Um, the most informative data will save time, human effort, and consequently money. So then if we have a small data set of labeled data, and then um, a large data set of unlabeled data, uh, we have to select the most uh, useful and the most informative 
uh, instances from that uh, data set uh, of unlabeled data so then so that uh, the human expert does not need not does not need to spend time labeling data that is not useful that is not informative and that will not contribute uh, that will not contribute to the performance of the model and for use to select the right data for a human to label it, uh, we need a strategy, right? And this strategy um, is mainly based on the uncertainty of the model. We are going to focus on the, um, these strategies in the next session because this is a, uh, the, uh, an introduction to the topic. And it's very important that you understand the main architecture and that are available and also how everything works beforehand, right? So then um, active learning, the main architecture, what do we have? So first we have a machine learning model that is trained on available label data, right? This can be a small data set. And then we uh, pre-process the, this data and then prepare to the machine learning model. And then we test as usual, the, the, the machine learning model. And then we apply this model to uh, unla the un uh, unlabeled data, right? So automatically define its label. If the, the, the performance of the model is, is good, in this task, then we can extend this, this, um, this classification task to a label data set and deploy the model. Or if not, we, uh, we uh, sample a subset of new data and then we present to humans to label um, this subset of, uh, of um, data. And then um, this um, newly uh, labeled data set is then sent to the model again, and then the model is retrained. So then um, an active learning workflow uh, involves humans and the machine taking turns in classifying texts or classifying instances of uh, data set uh, into categories. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So then here, uh, um, comparing active learning with passive learning, we have, uh, actually passive learning is the, the regular workflow in a, in a machine learning, um, in a machine learning um, project, right? So then we have some data here, some labeled data. Uh, what we do is that we prepare this data and then we send to a machine learning model and then we train this model, then we evaluate this model, and then we deploy the model. This is the um, traditional workflow of a passive learning. The main difference in um, uh, between active learning and passive learning is that after evaluating the data, now the model, uh, if the model is not um, accurate enough and probably uh, it's not accurate and, uh, enough because you have a small data set. So then we get unlabeled data and then we select the most useful instances from that um, um, uh, data set of unlabeled data. And, and then these useful informative instances will then be used um, by a human who is going to annotate this data and who is going to label this data, add labels to this data. And after adding label to this data, um, uh, this is sent to the main um, data set and then the model is retrained. And then this loop continues until we get, um, until we get the performance and until we reach our objective. Okay, so this is the main difference between active learning and passive learning. Okay, <clears throat> so the goal is to increase the classification performance by interacting with humans 
who will label the most informative instances, right? And as I said, uh, the most informative instances are defined based on certain strategies. Here I have, for instance, an example. Um, uh, in my case, I, I uh, in classifying uh, texts in the regulatory domain. So uh, we have, I have here some re good results reducing human effort. For, so for instance, here I have comparing 700 instances with um, um, passive learning and active learning, we can see here, I get uh, an F1 score of 0 0.8 with passive learning. And with the same uh, amount of data, I get a perform I increase performance with an F1 score of 0 0.85. Um, same here, I got um, a performance with passive learning, passive learning of um, 0 0.65 F1 score with 500 instances, and then uh, I increased performance of 0 uh, uh, 0 0.8 with 500 instances with the same amount of data. So then this means that uh, for me to get uh, the same performance uh, with passive learning, uh, the same performance with passive learning, I would need less data using um, a strategic selection of data, right? So this is the main idea to reduce uh, the error rates and also to reduce and increase the performance of a model um, using uh, less data. This is the main idea. Okay, so um, so as I said, to, uh, we use active learning um, when we need to annotate data and there is no budget or time, when you must label domain-specific texts in the regulation domain, medical domain, in hiring, human experts can be very expensive, but you can also um, improve, uh, you know, you can also use active learning just to improve the performance your, of your model faster, right? So then it's not always that you have to use a human in the loop, but you can also use a strategy here just to select the most informative uh, instances uh, um, of your unlabeled data set and then improve the performance of your model faster. This is another use case. And that and that could be really useful um, for most of the uh, most of the time. So here I can show you um, that I show you the most famous NLP use cases that work with active learning nowadays. So then, for instance, we have um, search engines like Google Search. So then, when we ask a question to Google, we have a list of links that we can uh, select. And then once that we click on a link, for instance, the second link or the third link, we are probably labeling that data for the engine because we are telling that um, engine that um, that link is uh, the most appropriate for, for to answer your question. Right, so um, search engine are one of the most um, most famous and most used um, use cases in um, um, NLP active learning that we have um, nowadays. And also, it involves a human in the loop. A second example uh, is um, Amazon um, review. Uh, when we have to uh, rate, star rate products on Amazon, uh, we are also labeling the data and we are also interacting with the system because when we label our data and then we add um, sentiment to that data, so then we are contributing to a machine learning model to infer the sentiment associated with that product uh, on Amazon website. So then this is also another very famous use case, um, active learning for NLP use case. 
Um, okay. Um, okay. So there are two main um, architectures, active learning architectures nowadays. Nowadays, um, uh, which is called stream based. Stream based is mainly used when we don't have um, when unlabeled data arrives uh, continuously, and uh, when they are not. Um, available they are there are, when we don't have a collection of unlabeled data uh, ready available right for us to apply a strategy so this is the the case of crowdsourcing um that uh unlabeled samples arrives uh, sequen uh sequentially in the form of continuous and rapid streams so then um then uh, we apply an active learning strategy uh, on each of the <clears throat> of the labels um, as they arrive, right? Um, and then we have to decide, and the, uh, the strategy have to decide if it is an informative instance or not. So this is the stream based um, strategy. Another uh, strategy is called uh, pool based, which is in the literature, the most common strategy uh, architecture. Um, it, um, it works by um, um, ranking uh, a pool of data in terms of its utility. So the most useful uh, instances, they will be at the top of the pool and the, uh, the least useful instances will be at the bottom of the, top, of the pool. Um, this is the most common architecture, um, and then I'm going to show you in this course um, examples of this um, architecture. Okay, so then the main difference between stream base and pool base is that stream base obtains one instance at a time uh, sequentially from one stream data source, and then the pool base. Um, evaluates and ranks the entire collection of unlabeled data. So then this is the main difference between the two uh, strategies. Okay. Um, okay, so then uh, if you don't have questions, it's already time for a quiz. And then I would like you to, to drop your answers for this quiz in the chat so then I can see what you think. It's very uh, easy questions. I'm sure that you are going to um, uh, will be able to answer very quickly the questions. Any questions so far? No? Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, okay. okay, so then active learning. Just a moment. Um, I have to. Okay. Active learning is used when we have loads of labeled data, we need to increase human effort, or we need hum uh, human expertise to obtain labeled data. What do you think? Yes, everyone, <laughs> letter C, yes, we need human um, expertise to label, um, uh, to label data. Yeah, we, well, if we have loads of data, we don't need active learning, right? Unless you use active learning just to get a better performance or faster, right? Um, we don't need, um, just a moment. Um, we don't need to. Uh, we don't need active learning uh, to increase human effort. Actually, we use active learning to reduce human effort, and we need um, active learning to, um, when we use uh, when we need to interact with a human to obtain labeled data. All right. So then, that was a very useful one. Uh, sorry, I think it, this is the, the previous one. Okay. Stream-based learning. 
selects one example at a time from prediction subquery, evaluates and ranks the entire collection of unlabeled data, is identical to pool based learning, but does not involve a human in the loop. What do you think? Yes, very, very easy. Yes, uh, this is the, it's A, right? A because um, to evaluate and rank the entire collection of unlabeled data is the pool based architecture and uh, is not identical to the pool based. And in both cases, uh, stream based and also pool based, you, you can. Um, you, um, it, it, can involve a human in the loop, right? It's not always the case. It depends on your objective. But then in both cases, a human in the loop can be used, right? OK. Uh, active learning is used only for natural language uh, processing problems. I always need to involve a human in the loop or can be used with any machine learning algorithm. What do you think? Seems a more difficult question. Yes, more difficult question. Well, <clears throat> just a moment. Well, as I just said, uh, depending on your, I saw some people uh, answering letter B instead of C. So the correct answer is letter C. We can use active learning with uh, any machine learning algorithm, but um, it's not always that we need a human in the loop. Um, as I said, uh, we need to involve, or we, we can use a human D loop to label the, the informative instances, but it's not always the case. I'm going to show you a case in which does not involve a human in the loop. Um, and then because we can um, use the strategy to select the most useful instances from the, from the pool uh, without a human in the loop. We can, um, uh, we can uh, uh, simulate uh, this um, this uh, this um, uh, this strategy, right? We can simulate the, the the a better performance if we have labeled data, and then we just want to reach a good uh, performance faster. Okay. Um, so this is those are the main um, the main. Um, questions of our quiz. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer now. And then after that, I'm going to show you what we're going to see in the next session. Any questions? Okay, let me ask you a question, Natalia, until yeah. uh, other, other people probably will have some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. So it looks like if I get back to the example of seven, 500 and 700 data, I see when you use active learning, you get the same performance of uh, seven, 500, 700 data with 500 data plus active learning. So that's the proof. But from the other hand, human has been involved in uh, labeling. I mean, so you cannot say you have labeled 500 data, you have labeled you know, perhaps more data. So is there any kind of numbers to say, okay, if I could get to that performance using 700 data, labeled data, then using the active learning, I've had 500 data labeled and plus some human labeled, but all together it is less than the 700. Is that the case? Um, am I correct? Yes, well, we can, well, you can, select from the pool the most useful instances, uh, right? And also, you can also uh, like mix the strategies. You can um, you can select, uh, automatically select the most useful instances and you can also use um, a, a human to label, 
the data. If the model is uncertain of, of that, um, of that um, um, instance, right? Of the, the category of that instance. So then you can mix these both strategies um, together. Um, and then, um, well, there is no, um, there is no um, correct, like uh, there is no um, a certain amount of data that needs to be labeled to get a certain performance, right? So then this depends on, on your use case. It depends on um, uh, whether if you train a whole model, um, uh, or, or, using a, a, a certain data set. And if we compare using active learning, you see that sometimes um, you, you, have, you, need, um, you still need loads of data to get that performance compared to the, to the model trained on the entire data set. And then in this case, what you have to do is to try to change the performance or even add a human in the loop. Right, so then uh, a human will be useful in labeling that data and making the 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 the, the model um, certain, more certain of the the category of that instance. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and another question, perhaps, would be, let me know if I'm correct. So. <laughs> Uh, in supervised learning, you have some expert people, particularly in the fields like health, law, and so on. They label the data, but in this case, but for the active learning, you don't need necessarily to have expert people. So they are kind of the user of the product. I'm coming back to that example you showed me, the search engine, right? So mm -hmm. is that correct? So that's where actually you save, I mean, instead of having expert people to label the data in the beginning, you will use a smaller set of label data and then you release the product and then user along the way, they label more data for you and help you to increase the performance. Yeah. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, sometimes I uh, we don't need uh, expert, experts to label some, it depends on your use case. And um, sometimes, so in the, in the case of the search engines, everyone can be uh, a human in the loop, right? Because we know what we are looking for. In the case of um, 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 sentiment analysis, right? In rating products on Amazon website, everyone can also do that because everyone knows what they like and what they dislike. Um, so then it's an example of a human in the loop, but does not involve human expertise. Actually, and actually, you don't pay for that. That's the point. No, we don't pay for that. No, yeah, we don't need to pay for that. But then it's a, a, a way to improve the model, right? With a human in the loop. Yeah. And a way to improve the model and, and maybe even faster. Yeah, I understand. And maybe the other example could be the keyboards on the mobile phones when you type something there are some examples suggested yes exactly another example would be um even when on our phone when we select the the the, the next word that we want to type and then the the the, the system predicts the next word that is also a, a case of human interlocutive learning yeah, and it looks like it should be more complicated in some other areas. For example, in computer vision, active learning would be more challenging to ask human to be in the loop and help in, you know, uh, labeling. Maybe the recapture one when you uh, have some pictures and it is ask you which one is chimney, for example, or which one is bicycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it could be complicated in this case, especially because sometimes the um, the, the data presented to the human sometimes is not very clear. Um, uh, uh, one case is that that case of the uh, digits. Sometimes the, the model presents to the user. Uh, actually, there, there is an example on the internet. I'm going to, I can um, add here to the, the course material this example. Um, and then it's in this example, I tried this example and it's very complicated because I some, in some cases I could not 
say if I was seeing the number two or the number eight or the number three, right? When it's not very clear, it's even complicated even for the human. So this, for computer vision, sometimes in these cases, oh, oh, we have these problems. Yeah. Good, and sometimes uh, another very interesting human case in terms of computer vision is in this book, Home and the Loop Machine Learning, is when, for example, when training uh, driverless cars, um, we see, for instance, um, a man beside a bicycle. And then the, the, the human needs to label that. In, in relation to in relation to to the picture, if not to the picture, but to the image, in terms if it's uh, a bicycle or a human. So then there are these ambiguous cases, right? So then this is also another uh, complicated uh, case. Yeah, another sure. complicated case in terms of uh, natural language processing is multi-label classification, which is the case that I am dealing with right now. With binary classification is much easier. It's possible to use all the strategies available, uncertainty uh, sampling strategies available, but with multi-label classification, it's a little bit more complicated because we most of the times need an ensemble of um, models. Sure. Uh, I'm afraid I'm asking all the question. Well, let me <laughs> ask another question. If, is there any ethical aspect in active learning? Very similar to other AI, you know, fields? Well, I think ethics is always related to AI in, in all of the AI domains, right? Ethics is always involved, but specific to active learning, I cannot think of an ethic that is really specific to active learning, but I can research and bring examples next class. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? No, everything's clear. So, okay, next class we are going to see it's when the, the course gets really excited because it's when we are going to see machine learning, active learning main strategies, um, and then how to sample the right instances um, to label um, the, for humans to label, okay? So this is the topic of the next question. And in the third um, session, we are going to have a hands-on activity, okay? So that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much. Shall I stop um, sharing and also um, recording? Yeah, thank you very much, Natalia. No problem. If you have if you still have questions, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to answer. You can unmute yourself. Um, uh, thank you for the session, Natalia. I had a question. Yes. So uh, in passive learning as well, uh, when we talk about passive learning, we're talking about that we are not looking at any relabeling after the model has been deployed or are we looking at uh, unstructured labeling or just random sampling, relabeling uh, using experts uh, from let's say uh, incorrect predictions or are we just saying that there will be no relabeling or we're not going back to look at uh, any of the incorrect predictions in passive learning? Mm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, you want to know if in passive learning um, it it involves certain strategy of uh, yeah. So uh, I I mean to ask like in passive learning, do we mm -hmm. relabel at all? Do we have experts look at a random sample uh, of predictions for them to uh, relabel, or do we just not have any relabeling at all? No, we don't have any. It's a regular, it's a regular machine learning workflow. We just, um, the, it's a, we call it passive learning because compared to active learning, there is no strategy to um, use, uh, used to select the, 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 
the, the, the labels for to train the model, right? In passive learning, it's just random. It's just random. And then usually, actually, we are going to see later on, we compare the traditional workflow of machine learning we, that we call passive learning with the active learning to, to compare the performance of the two models. Uh, but then in passive learning, we, we don't use any strategies, just random. Okay, select you. randomly these instances. Thank you. No problem, thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you very much. So see you next Friday. I'm going to upload the slides to, um, to the Cedar platform and hope you to see you all guys in the next session. Okay, bye-bye.